During my reelection campaign for the United States Senate, I gave a series of speeches called The Gathering Storm of the 21st Century. I spoke more bluntly about radical Islam than most politicians did in 2006 and have continued to do so. Since I am convinced that Americans and our political leadership still do not sufficiently understand the nature and the extent of the threat we face. So we simply cannot stop talking about the threat of radical Islam to America. Most Americans think our problem is a small group of terrorists. Few are aware that within the Islamic world, there is a fierce battle for the hearts and minds of Muslims, and that this new century will largely be determined by that battle's outcome. The conflict within Islam can be described as a fight over whether or not the views of these radicals are really a form of authentic Islam. The battle is often described rather simplistically between radical Islam and moderate Islam. But such a description is simplistic because it doesn't tell us much about the beliefs of moderate Muslims. This is where the voice of Tufiq Hamid is so important and instructive. I met Tafik shortly after founding the Program to Protect America's Freedom at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Tafik knows about jihad, terrorism, and radical Islam because he was a jihadist. Tafik gives a challenging message to his fellow Muslims. What is a moderate Muslim? Can you be a moderate Muslim and still support the death penalty for those who convert from Islam? Can you be a moderate Muslim and still refuse to condemn those who refer to Jews as pigs and monkeys? Charges of Islamophobia bounce off him like rubber bands. He simply asks us to consider the truth. I was a very innocent child. My dreams were just to play soccer, to listen to some music, to collect stamps. I was just an enthusiastic child who wanted to serve God. One step forward, I want to go into the path of violence. I was ready to burn churches, declare war on non-Muslims, killing the apostates, stoning women, amputating the hands of thieves. I planned to go to Afghanistan to join with the jihadi groups there. If you told me suicide bombing, I would do this. Do anything to, 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 to die in a war for Allah. taught me how to hate. When I joined the medical school, I met with some people who were members of the Jama'a Islamiyya, which was working legally inside the medical school. They used to have their own mosque, and the, their own library, and they used to come every day to give us obligatory lectures before the scientific lectures. These lectures were all about Islam and the revival of Islam, and they invited me to go with them and join them. They convinced us that the wealth in Saudi Arabia and this luxury in life, all because they apply and implement Islamic law or Sharia law, killing the apostates, stoning women, cutting the hands of thieves. So this was their whole mission and teaching to Islamize our medical school. Later on, uh, they were discovered to be a terrorist Islamic organization that prepared many people to, to be jihadists or terrorists. These very first few steps toward this mosque 
were fundamental in, in my whole life because it, they changed me from a very innocent child at some stage of my life to a beast who become ready to die and kill and cause harm for non-Muslims, thinking that this will satisfy Allah. So this is the first step toward my brainwashing uh, that they stop my critical thinking. It was the opposite of my father used to teach me. I noticed something very strange. Instead of just starting a prayer together as any other mosque, they asked us to stand in lines as together, and someone came to make sure that our shoulders are touching each other with no gaps at all. And I, I couldn't understand why they are doing this. When the Imam or the leader of the prayer said, God love those who fight for his cause, they fight together in the war as if they are one wall together, no gaps. So even within inside the prayer itself, they started to make you feel that, that you are at war. After this, some friend invited me to go to the bookshop to give me some books to learn about Islam. He gave me many books like this one, for example, this book. He gave me a book for Ibn Taymiyyah, which is one of the founders of what we call Salafi Islam, the very extremist form of Islam. And these books, unfortunately, teach a lot of violent things. They teach that you should kill the apostate. You uh, should stone women to death for sexual uh, relations. They teach you to, to be rough and, and cruel with the non-Muslims as well. So they are full of violent beliefs and thoughts. And in few month period, I became a person who became ready, is ready to die for Allah in, in jihad. And they used very powerful brainwashing tactics. The first brainwashing tactic that they used was the hellfire. I will never forget how powerful it was. It was through torture and the torturing techniques themselves were described in details. So you become truly frightened if you are a child and someone is teaching you, for example, this verse. You sabbu min fawqi ru'usihim al Boiling water will be poured over their head. This boiling water will dissolve their tissues and their guts. So the first impression that in the hell, which will go forever, and the next verse comes to make the story real vivid. They tell you that whenever their skins are cooked at bar in, the, in this barbecue or hellfire, we will replace the skins their skin by new skin to be retortured again and again for infinity of time. So the description of hellfire was very frightening, and they used the concept that there is al Su'ban al Akra, a bold snake that will come to us in the grave to, 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 to attack us if we do not pray and we do not follow the, the teaching strictly. The second mechanism was the concept of sex. When I joined the medical school, not only me, but many of the students were not able to marry because either of financial limitations or also because it was not uh, socially acceptable to marry while you are a student. And having any extramarital relationship was strongly prohibited in the culture and in the second life you will be tortured in hell forever for having any relationship. On the other hand, when you read in the, in the books themselves, when you open the Islamic books, you read in, in clearly that the women are waiting for us there in the paradise. And the description how they will be attractive, how they will be white in color. So you, you, you have on one hand this suppression and on the other hand sexual fantasies. This created a distorted mind in us and made many of us ready to die, to go to paradise just to try sex and to have it. I went through 
uh, three stages toward becoming a jihadist who became ready, ready to do anything, including killing, burning. The three steps were to teach us to hate, and then to suppress our conscience, and then to be able to accept violence as a way of, of dealing with, with, with others. Hatred was based on certain interpretations or teaching of the religion. For example, they taught us that uh, we should not have friends from Jews and Christians. The ABCs are these violent concepts. A, apostate, killing the apostate. B, beating women. C, calling Jews pigs and monkeys. D, declaring jihadi wars on non-Muslims to subjugate them to Islam. E, enslaving female war prisoners and raping them. F, fighting Jews before end days and killing all of them. G, killing gays. We are not allowed to think critically. We are not allowed to say this is wrong. We are not allowed to criticize even the books. The hatred start to develop toward others. Uh, and then how to suppress our conscience occurred when they taught us you can do it because God and Allah permitted it. Once this happened, they taught us how to accept the violence. Beating women, for example, was acceptable. Uh, killing someone because he converts from Islam to Christianity or other religion. Once this happened, you, will not, you should not be surprised if some of these people who, who learned how to be violent took it further to attack you and do terrorist acts. One of the moments that uh, affected me uh, during this stage of my life was when I met with uh, uh, Dr. Ayman al-Zawahri, who became later on the second in command of Al-Qaeda. And in fact, many people believe that he's the real brain behind Al-Qaeda. I believe he is one of the people who truly loved God. He wanted to serve him, but his energy was directed in the wrong path. And one day he gave us a lecture, and I will never forget the enthusiasm, the power, the charisma. And the man was speaking with passion and belief that's beyond imagination. He was speaking about the concept of how Muslims should dominate the world, how we should return the Islamic Khilafah, to, to how we should see Sharia law implemented all over the world. This was a global dream. You can see it in his eyes. You can tell it from his words. I just felt the power of Islam. I felt that we are returning to, to, to control the world as we did before. After some time, they started to force us on everyday Islamic lectures. And one day, I'll never forget it, they had a fight with a Christian professor called Edward. Dr. Edward wanted to start his lecture and they had a fight with him because they wanted to continue the Islamic lecture first. Dr. Edward said, no, I should start my lecture in anatomy. And they broke his hand. And this just shows you how a small prayer room that the university offered them one day changed it to create these vicious creatures who intervene in, intervene in the freedom of others. Uh, this was probably the most dramatic moment here that, that started me the process of, of, of thinking backward. When I saw the GI people breaking the hand of uh, Dr. Edward, I decided to withdraw. It, it was a difficult decision because many of them started to exert pressure on me. My mother raised an issue for me. She felt that many of the references that I'm using to justify hatred and violence were not directly from the Quran, but were, were from the other explanations or teaching or jurisprudence books. So she encouraged me to try to look again only to the Quran and try to have good heart while interpreting it. And I started to question 
whether this interpretation is correct or not correct. It, it the most conflicting time in my life. I wanted to satisfy Allah in my way of understanding him at that time. And at the same time, I don't want to do crime. My conscience was telling me, no, Taufik, you cannot do this. It's against your basic morals. So it was like a period of hesitation. What shall I do? Where shall I go? So in this moment, I had like awakening of my conscience back again. Within this stage, I developed a more advanced way of interpretation of the Quran. For example, the Quran does not teach that apostates should be killed at all. In fact, the Quran stated no compulsion in religion and stated clearly that whoever wants to be a, a, a believer, it's his right to do so. And whoever wants not to believe in Islam anymore, it's his right to do so. So the Quran never preached killing apostates. But on the other hand, these kind of books that are like is considered integral and essential to the current Islamic education teaches that apostates should be killed. The same Quran never preached stoning of women till death for adultery, never, but it is in the other books. In our culture, one of the problems that we had was that we were judgmental. This man is infidel. This man is, is he will go to hell. This doesn't wear the hijab. And we, we, it creates a lot of hatred. I tried to teach tolerance to my followers at that time in a very different manner. One day I was speaking in Michigan. After my talk, some nice imam, he was from Singal. He stood and said to me, why, Dr. Hamid, you are trying to present us in, in such a manner? I am a peaceful imam and I preach love and peace and harmony and I don't preach anti-Semitism. And I said to him, look, imam, it's so easy to stand and say I'm a peaceful imam. But if you are truly peaceful and moderate imam, why don't you invite me and some of our Jewish brothers and sisters here to your next Friday prayer and stand openly uh, in public in front of your congregations in the Friday prayer and say in clear, unambiguous and clear manner that Jews are not pigs and monkeys. Would you do this, imam? He looked down, went backward, without saying a word. If they were truly moderates, why they do not stand clearly against such violent form of teaching? Why they don't stand clearly and say, we are against killing the apostate? Clearly, we are against beating women. Polygamy is wrong. Stoning women to death is wrong. Justifying jihad to subjugate people to Islam is absolutely wrong. Killing gays that's happening in Iran and Saudi Arabia is wrong why they don't do this if they are truly moderate Muslims. Because he knows the moment he will stand against some of the fundamental teaching like this, he will have trouble from his own congregation. When I think about the most dramatic moment in my whole life, it was when I realized that Islamic fundamentalists in Pakistan slaughtered an innocent journalist called Daniel Peer. I was very angry, I couldn't sleep. I awake at 2 a.m. in the morning and I took my, a pen and I started to write. I said to Daniel, أقسم أني لن أترك اسمك يمحى من ذاكرة التاريخ. أقسم أني لن أترك اسمك. I swear that I will never ever leave your name or let your name be erased from the memory of history. وسأكتب اسمك في الصخر. And I will carve your name in the top of the mountains so everybody will see it. 
وسأكتب اسمك بالدمع and I will write your name with my tears فما قتلوك وحدك يا دانيال they didn't only kill you oh دانيال بل قتلوا الحق وقتلوا الحب وقتلوا أحلام الأجيال but they killed the meaning of love the meaning of humanity and the dreams of the coming generations they killed the meaning of love the meaning of humanity أقسم بأنينك وقت الذبح I swear with your groaning pains when they slaughtered you وبدمع طفلك وبدمع طفلك في الرحم I swear with the tears of your child when it was in the uterus in the moment when they killed you أني أني لن أنساك أني أني لن أنساك يا دانيال that I will never ever forget you oh دانيال will never ever forget you دانيال إن قتلوك لأنك يهودي if they have killed you because you are a Jew فأنا يهودي منذ الآن Then I am a Jew from now on. دمك دمي Your blood is my own blood. روحك روحي يا دانيال Your soul is my own soul. فلا تنسى فأنا مثلك إنسان. Don't forget that I'm a human being like you are. Attacking such innocent person and slaughtering him in such barbaric manner in the name of God was for me unbearable. I was so affected by it and I just couldn't stop my tears in this moment and I said to my wife I, I, I just wish to see one of his family or his father and I dream that his father cries on my shoulder in this moment and amazingly in few years time it just happened by absolute chance here I met with his father and I shared with him my poem and the father he was not able to stop his tears so I went to him and he cried on my shoulder so the dream has become real and I just felt so happy that I managed to, to, to give love and care to, to such a great father and to share with him in one meaning that we should not allow any system that goes beyond these values and think that it's religious freedom to express and promote values that totally contradicts the basic values of humanity. I declared war not to destroy Islam, but to save Islam. I declared war on the violent teaching to save the young Muslims from, what, from, from going into the same, same path of Dr. Al-Zawahri. And if we truly care for the future of mankind, we should not let this phenomena proliferate. We should intervene, we should do something as a human race who cares for each other. When you teach hatred, you do not expect that the outcome will be love. So when you teach this form of jihadism and the concepts of wars to subjugate others to your belief system, don't expect anything but escalation of violence. And some people may take it to the, to the extreme, like the Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, and some people just stop at the level of hatred. But all of them are parts of, of a dynamic process that ends into violence. So September 11th, in my view, was the normal and the most expected outcome. The phenomena of violent Islam and violent teaching Islam is affecting our civilization. And we should realize that destruction is much easier than building. You see how many years it took them to build the Twin Towers in New York City, and how many hours it took the terrorists to destroy them. And the same can happen to all our values and civilization if we didn't care for them. The problem here is when you deal with a slowly growing phenomena. It's a choice whether to allow it to grow until it manifests or you try to do something before this stage. It's like if you return it back in history to the time of the Holocaust. Would you allow Hitler to preach his views of violence and hatred under any name 
until you see six million people of Jews and others dying in, in the Holocaust? Or will you stop this before the crime happens? If I had a, a peaceful form of education when I was young, I wouldn't have thought to become a jihadist. The same for al-Zawahri, the same for bin Laden, the same for many. Islamic terrorism is in a sense like cancer. The more you ignore it, the more it grows and destroys you. To defeat such a global terror, the whole civilized world, Americans and non-Americans, Republicans and Democrats, religious and non-religious should all unite, unite and then unite.